Hi folks, it is me, the Bee, and welcome back to another review. So I just decided to do something a little bit different today. Rather than review a John Carpenter movie, I am going to review Ridley Scott's 1985 fantasy film Legend, because truth be told, I don't think I've ever discussed this film at length before, and even though it has its own sort of a reputation among a, a among a cult audience, I do legitimately feel that Legend has finally lived up to what it was originally trying to do. We all know that Ridley Scott is a very famous filmmaker, and he is a tremendously skilled one. Um, so when he took on the project for Legend, he was really stepping outside of his comfort zone once you think about it. In the past, he had directed, you know, films such as Blade Runner and, uh, and Alien and uh, the, the Duelists, like three very different sorts of films and all of which dealt with some pretty, uh, you know, dark and, uh, you know, for that matter, horrifying details. But with Legend, this was Ridley Scott's version of a grim fairy tale. Now, Grimm's fairy tales were exactly that. They were grim. They tackle some really dark and mature subject matter. And uh, those of you out there who, you know, are familiar with your fairy tales, fairy tales were more or less used as uh, fables, if you will, to keep the populace in order, be it very curious children or disobedient women and, you know, what have you. And uh, fairy tales were used to teach a lesson. So, with Ridley Scott taking on this project, rather than try to make it a, um, you know, a preachy sort of story, what he did was a quite a clever subversion of the genre, and we will get into that a little bit later. So, as many of you may well know, Legend saw the uh, cinematic debut of Tom Cruise, and right off the bat, he's not the best part about this movie. I mean, the, he's he tries, okay? This is Tom Cruise who's very earnest and he's trying very, very hard, but unfortunately he's not very astute with the material. But, you know, that's, that's no sort of slight against him. As we all know, he's gotten way better as he's gotten older. This film also stars a 15-year-old Mia Sara. Well, I think she was 15 at the time of which she made this film. And this is where the genre subversion really comes into play here. Mia Sara plays Princess Lily, and uh, she's... Look, Mia Sara is so beautiful in this movie. She is this gorgeous fairy tale princess with her beautiful brown doe eyes and her, her delicate face and uh, just the way she moves. You know, everything about her is your typical fairy tale princess. But as the story of legend goes on, and even though she finds herself kidnapped by some dark and mysterious beast, played by the indomitable Tim Curry, that word is very difficult for me, for me to say, she actually finds herself in a very proactive role. Okay, so, like I was saying before, fairy tales were used to uh, be a lesson to people, and when it came to fairy tales that cover women, in them, you know, women are either portrayed as completely clueless or neglectful or foolish, childish, what have you. You know, they're very, very infantilized in fairy in fairy stories. Here, Princess Lily actually stands toe to toe with the Lord of Darkness himself, and it's just a. This is one thing that has been constantly mentioned about this film. It subverts this, the fairy tale stereotype. Rather than have the princess all, you know, helpless and innocent and, you know, easily corruptible by the darkness, she actively fights. She uses her mind and her wit and her charm against the one who has captured her. Which brings me to Tim Curry as darkness. Tim Curry is more or less known as a ham, but let's face it, being a ham is not a bad thing. And when you are in a, a story that deals with unicorns and demons and goblins and, and all sorts of mystical animals, you, you can't afford to go uh, half assed And there is nothing half assed about Tim Curry's darkness. And most of that comes down to Rob Bottin's wonderful makeup effects work on darkness, to this day, which has not been rivaled. Bottin is a very visceral visual effects maker, he makes sure that a lot of his work looks tangible. And even though Darkness is this big, red, hulking beast, Tim Curry is given the ability to emote through it. 
There is something about the way the makeup is done that allows Tim Curry to act and deliver his lines and, you know, put credence behind his character. And surprisingly so, with all this makeup and this bigness and theatricality, Curry is actually quite subtle, for lack of a better term, because he knows, you know, what's on his face. He knows what his body is in. So he doesn't go, you know, over the top. You know, his darkness is very... Uh, look, I I'm going to call it right now. Darkness is one of the best interpretations of the devil that I have ever, ever seen. And when he and Mia Sara's characters come together, they are the best parts of the film. Now, I'm just going to talk very briefly about the original script, or story, if you will, of Legend. Legend was a very different beast. It was very much the grim fairy tale in which Princess Lily finds herself in Congress with darkness. Throughout the story, Lily begins to change because of an unfort of a, uh, unfortunate incident. Um, uh, and as she changes, she becomes more bestial and primal. And uh, finally, she and darkness do the wild thing. And uh, it's, a, it's a very... Uh, it's a very dark and mature take on the story and uh, I feel it would have been interesting um, but obviously you know the script had to be doctored and studio executives had to you know veto a couple of things and I can understand why um, but yeah it's an interesting concept and even though that the finished product of Legend isn't as uh, in-depth and graphic as the original story was you still get sensations of that Specifically, when Lily and Darkness talk, there is a huge sense of sexual tension between them. But it's not overt, like a Darkness is actively trying to charm Lily. Now, Darkness doesn't have the, the human uh, understanding of what it is to be in love, but the way he feels about Lily confuses him. As he confesses to his father, who is presumably, you know, Satan himself, He's like, I, you know, I have the world in my hands, but there's something about this girl that distracts me. There's something about her that really gets under my skin. And, you know, rather than run away from it and try to, 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 to eliminate her, he tries to convert her. He tries to charm her and get her over to his side. And when Lily catches on to this, she doesn't... Well, initially she, she does refuse him, but when she realizes that, you know, if she plays along with him, she can buy Tom Cruise's character more time to get to her, to rescue her, and of course, rescue the unicorn. And it's this, the scene of which this it happens, it is so good because when Darkness flies into a rage, you know, due to, to her refuse, like she starts to laugh and giggle and start to be all playful. And Darkness is just so perplexed by this, and he asks, you know, well, why are you so eager? And, you know, she just completely, you know, panders to this. And <laughs> Darkness is so adorably naive in that moment because he is just so willing to believe that she is telling him the truth. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> yeah, it's a, a, tonally speaking, this film can be somewhat uneven because the theatrical release of Legend is very different from the director's cut. Both of them, to me, are very, very different, but at the same time, you know, one isn't necessarily less than the other. The director's cut is very story-focused. A lot more detail is paid, you know, to what's going on. But in the theatrical release, it goes at a very sort of brisk pace. And even though the, the audience is sometimes left wondering as to, you know, where they are and what the story is, where the story is going, that the same result ultimately remains. And, and, the, and the end result is one of enchantment and of wonder. This is a gorgeous looking film. Um, it is by far one of Ridley Scott's most beautiful looking films he has ever made. And I don't make that sort of claim lightly. Now, let's talk about Tom Cruise a little bit. Like I said, he is pretty much the weakest link of this film, but not through a lack of trying. He really does come across as just uh, an everyday man who is tossed into a very abnormal situation. Now, Cruz's character is a, is, a, is a boy who lives in the forest. He is one with nature. And he is the one who, you know, comes into contact with Princess Lily and they start this little, you know, relationship here. And he shows her the unicorn because 
you know, he wants to give her a sense of wonder about the natural world and what a world he lives in. He is very in tune with the, the, the residents of the forest of which he lives. The fairies, the, the goblins, you know, the good, the bad and the ugly. And uh, speaking of ugly, who didn't have nightmares about Meg Mucklebow? Mucklebones, played by Rob Picardo. It's just a, oh, it is another one of uh, Rob Bettine's greatest creations. There is something so off-putting and witch-like and just disgusting about Mucklebones that really makes you feel dirty when you look at him, uh, or her, I should say. And uh, the, the 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 sequence between uh, Cruz's character um, Jack and Meg Mucklebones, it, it is one that pretty much uh, cements itself in the nostalgic memory. Now, I didn't actually see Legend until I was about 24 years old. So I, whatever, uh, you know, preconceptions I had about the film were pretty much ones I had read and heard rather than ones of which I remember. Now, uh, upon my initial viewing, as much as I really did love the visuals and, you know, that the acting with the, by Mia Sara and Tim Curry, I didn't love it. Um, but it still had a sense of curiosity about it. So a little while later, I got to see the movie again. I saw the theatrical truck, the theatrical cut. Oh my God. I, I got to see the theatrical cut and the director's cut. And like I said before, they're very different, but you know, they complement each other well. The score by Tangerine Dream in uh, the theatrical cut, it is very eclectic. And that is one of the major things that separate the theatrical cut from the director. Director's cut. I'm sorry. I'm just spewing words all over the place here. Um, so what else do I have to say about this film? Well, it is tremendously unique. What I really love about 80s fantasy films is that they aren't afraid to be light and dark at the same time. There was no such thing as ridiculous censorship. And even though there was only so much that a PG film could, could show, this was when a PG film wasn't necessarily seen as a bad thing. PG back in the 80s didn't necessarily mean a complete sanita uh, sanitation of all, of the, 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 the more malicious and mature material. No, no, no. It's, uh, it had a sense of balance. It wasn't ridiculous or, you know, it didn't try to silence uh, a, a director's vision. Um, so, yeah, I, I certainly do feel that legend really does live up to the reputation it has gained over time. But it is a, it really is a shame that it didn't do well the box office because, you know, you, you had other films like The Dark Crystal and Labyrinth and The Last Starfighter. You had a really big collection of all these wonderful and diverse fantasy films. And it's just a shame that legend fell through the cracks due to some sort of, a, you know, tonal uh, difficulties in the movie. So, that being said, I give Legend a 4 out of 5. It has taken me a little while to fully appreciate it, but when you realize that Legend isn't just a traditional fairy tale story, but an actual sort of a, you know, spin on the on the genre, it's it's quite welcome. Once again, with Princess Lily being the true protagonist of the film and being so invested in her character, you know, this is Princess Lily's journey. This isn't Jack's journey. This is hers. And the way she finds herself being tossed into the situation and having to survive by using her will, it really is so inspiring. And once again, I have to praise Mia Sara for, you know, despite being so young, she displays a wisdom and a presence that is well beyond her years. And you can see why darkness is just so twistedly enamored with her. So thank you once again for listening to me ramble, guys, and as usual, I shall see you in the next video. Bye-bye for now.